Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to solve a problem that we found with our 2400 watt UPS project. This is solving a problem that we found right at the end of, well, one of our last videos. While we designed most of a boost mode PFC switch mode power supply, the DC bus voltage of our UPS needs to be isolated from both mains and the user, and a boost mode PFC just doesn't do that at all. So isolation allows the inverter output of our UPS to be neutral referenced and prevents electrocuting the user, and that's important. But what does this really mean? Well, this means that we need to make sure that our architecture is on track to support this requirement. Insufficient isolation in the UPS will force me to scrap the whole design, even if it technically generates a sine wave and works. Isolation is the difference between everything being fine and killing someone. The way that I see it, we have three different ways to fix this problem. Either find a different switch mode power supply architecture for our PFC, one that can establish isolation and power factor correction in one stage, find a different architecture for the inverter so that it has an isolated output, or use a two-stage design like what happens 95% of the time a PFC is implemented. The two-stage design is definitely the most common. Is that what's going to be right for us? More than anything. I want to avoid making the same mistake twice. I don't want to neglect something fundamental in our UPS architecture this time around. I don't want to cause one or many parts of our UPS to fail or not quite meet expectations in the end. There are so many examples from the last time, the last UPS we designed. The push-pull converter, the battery charger, the gate drive implementations. Those were particularly flaming piles of failure in our previous design. But that's okay. We've been designing a power factor corrected power supply topology based on a boost topology, which is great. We may very well continue on with this topology, but let's just think for a moment. We want to build modularity into the system. We want to have some sort of backplane and daughter cards. And the PFC is a big part of this UPS, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. But there is some real system level architecture work that needs to happen first. We need to architect the larger system before we dive too deep into one module and waste a bunch of time. Now this can be a pitfall for engineers, and I'm certainly no exception. We love design work. Design time is like playtime for some engineers, and yeah, definitely that's true for me. There is a real thrill that comes from diving into the physics behind a new switch mode power supply topology or application. I love power electronics. But that's besides the point. I'm being long-winded on purpose. I'm being long-winded to distract you from the point, and the point is that I've already made the same mistake. We're five videos into this project, and I've made my first mistake. I'm doing detailed design work without an architecture, so there's nothing constraining the design work, and that's bad news. There's one big justification that I can see here. It all started as exploration. Like, I didn't intend to put the cart before the horse. This all started out as a research project where we were researching how to implement power factor correction. I was exploring different topologies through calculations and simulations, just seeing what our options were and trying to see which arrangement of components might lead to the lowest overall losses. I was trying to gain enough context to make good architectural decisions. I was trying to set us up for success here. And that's all fine and good, but there was a critical line that we should never have crossed. When I started putting schematic symbols down on the page and selecting orderable part numbers, now that's where, without a doubt, I put the cart before the horse. I read the end of the book before I started at the beginning. That's where I was doing detailed circuit design without knowing what the circuit needed to do. What does this mean? Well, this means that we might have just wasted a whole bunch of time talking about a PFC that won't fit into the architecture. And to prevent wasting more time, we need to do some architecture development. We need to make a plan that ensures the PFC that we design has a place in the larger system. However, I'm not sure that we're quite ready to commit to this two-phase interleaved PFC, so let's keep exploring our options. Let's actually talk about some of that research that we've been doing to find the right topology. So our goal here was to find a way to establish 3.5 kV isolation from the mains input to the inverter output while also establishing five kilovolts of isolation between everything above 60 volts, anything that we can consider intrinsically dangerous and the user. So anything that I can touch needs to have five kilovolt isolation to that DC bus and mates. So the isolation between the user and high voltage has been established for a while now that was present in the old design. 
but where specific pieces of circuitry, where the different blocks live within our architecture is still up in the air. And that's good and bad, but ultimately what that means is that we've got some options. This means that any power supply topology involving a transformer could work. Let's consider adding a transformer to our inverter output by exploring the physics involved. This is an interesting challenge. See, any inverter fundamentally does not play nice with transformers. This is because inverters are trying to operate with traditional PWM. They're trying to force the output to whatever voltage we're driving to at that particular time, like a buck. And we do this by syncing and sourcing current with the inverter. We're not only pushing current in one direction. With most switchboard power supply topologies, that's not the case at all. And output rectification is almost always required when a transformer-based switchboard power supply design is implemented. And therefore, the diodes only allow for unidirectional power transfer. We can only push current and power out. But that's not the only problem. Transformers are not like inductors, where inductors are used in a buck kind of output or the output filter for an inverter. Transformers are not like coupled inductors either. If transformers are not allowed to establish volt second balance, the magnetic fields generated during one switching cycle are not completely dissipated by the time that next switching cycle starts. And that is a big problem. Without this balance, flux is constantly being added to the core. And since our geometry is constant, that means that the flux density is always increasing and the core is inevitably going to saturate. I can't tell you when, but I know that it will. It doesn't matter if the output power of this power supply is 1000 watts or 1 watt. Without volt second balance, our transformer will saturate. Yikes. So a, a push pull or full H converter always splits the duty cycle in half to establish this volt second balance. It makes the positive and negative half cycles, the positive and negative parts of this waveform applied across the transformer equal. If things are slightly out of balance, one of those two voltages, either the positive or negative one, they'll be slightly higher than the other one, and that's the transformer striving to establish this balance. It naturally wants to establish this balance, as long as we don't, of course, exceed the volt-second rating in one half. So where am I going with this? Well, if we try to drive a transformer in a way that is not balanced, that means that we need to think about the volt-second balance carefully. The output voltage observed in the transformer will approach positive infinity as duty cycle approaches 0%. And this will approach negative infinity as duty cycle approaches 100%. And this is its attempt to achieve volt second balance. It's trying to apply enough volts across it in well, almost zero seconds to establish volt second balance. So let's see what happens when we create an inverter output with a switch one power supply transformer across the output before the filter. The voltage peaks just above 100 volts on one side, and while well, the negative voltage is almost 300. You know, I bet if we measure the on time versus the off time, I bet the ratio would be the same. And yeah, sure enough, the on time is 7.52 microseconds and the off time is 2.44 microseconds. In other words, the transformer is seeing 100 volts times 7.52 microseconds or 0.752 millivolt seconds during the on time and 300 volts multiplied by 2.44 microseconds is 0.732 millivolt seconds. So 0.752 versus 0.732, those are approximately equal. In other words, the transformer achieved volt second balance by outputting three times the input voltage during what would normally be the off time. There was some energy stored in the inductance of our transformer and that came out. If you'll forgive some of the inaccuracy of the simulation because the integral is only as accurate as my manually selected window area, our transformer is definitely establishing volt second balance. There's no other way to explain the 3x magnitude in output voltage. But this makes the RMS output voltage, well, zero. Without an output rectifier, we won't get an RMS output voltage. With a rectifier, we don't have an inverter anymore. So our hands are kind of tied. If you're not seeing the problem yet, if you're not seeing the problem with this isolated inverter, let me try to rephrase this in a different way. Transformers fundamentally strive for volt second balance. They will generate voltage such that the product of voltage and time, both positive and negative applied are equal. Zero net voltage must be applied across the transformer in one switching cycles. Counting volts per second is integrating, so the average voltage across any potential output filter inductor that we might put on the second side of this transformer 
is going to be zero. The transformer is fundamentally counteracting what we're trying to do with PWM. We push the duty cycle to 33%, it pushes the voltage to three times. Through duty cycle, our controller is trying to establish 100% amplitude for a percentage of the time. If we add an output low pass filter, we expect to see that the output voltage will be proportional to the input voltage multiplied by the duty cycle. This is the governing equation for a buck. And in the case of our control signal, that's 3.3 volts applied by about 38%. And why does this occur? Well, we're pumping 100% of the typical voltage across the output capacitor 38% of the time. By applying 100% of this voltage 38% of the time, the low pass filter is averaging or removing all the high frequency information about the pulses, but it keeps the low frequency signal, which is that average voltage. So it becomes 38% of the input voltage, plus or minus and ripple, 100% of the time. And that's what we would expect. That's the expected behavior. However, if we add the same filter to the output of our transformer, wow, no, that looks different. I can clearly see that the average voltage is truly zero volts, regardless of duty cycle. We can confirm this through the RMS voltage measured on the transformer output, and we can confirm this with an output filter. For the record, the six-fold average being reported by LTSPICE is a result of the fact that I have not perfectly aligned a discrete number of switching cycles to the window area, but it is not contradicting the physics that I'm presenting. Okay, so a traditional PWM control through a transformer, just fundamentally not going to happen because the transformer will actively counteract what we're trying to do by modulating the duty cycle to establish volt second balance. I know that I said it wouldn't work, but you know what, let's just do it anyways. Let's rectify this output voltage just so you can see what it looks like. As food for thought, I've added a rectifier diode to the output of our transformer and the story is clear. The second trace, the green one that you're seeing, is the filtered PWM input multiplied by 60 to make the magnitude similar to what we would expect if this were going through the totem pole output and through the output filter. That's what we'd expect to see on the UPS. The red line is what should be the inverter output, which should be proportional to that control input. However, the output's just charging up to the peak voltage and stays there. There's insufficient load to cause the output of this filter to follow the sinusoidal link control signal. That's because we can only source current. We can't sink current back in through the output filter to ground. So conclusion then. Translating simple PWM through a transformer for inverter does not work well. And it does not work well because if we add the output rectification required to allow for volt second balance, the output wave shape can be heavily distorted. If we try to design out the rectification stage, well, then the average voltage on the output will always be zero regardless of the input duty cycle due to a transformer's need for volt second balance. My thought is that that was probably pretty advanced for newcomers and not a surprise to people intimately familiar with how transformers function, so basically I'm 100% sure that we've offended everyone watching. I hope that walking through this example of why transformers can't be used to directly isolate our inverter output helped you to learn something about transformers, and I hope that the pictures and simulations helped. If we can't have an isolated inverter, it would be great if there was an AC to DC switch from power supply topology that can be isolated, handle the 2400 watts we require, and only require one stage of magnetics. We're running out of room on this daughter card. So our PFC is not isolated due to its direct use of inductors, but perhaps there is another solution. I found a few articles describing what sounds like an awesome topology. As far as PFCs go, this is pretty groundbreaking. And the fact that a switch from power supply converter topology has a patent pending in 2010 tells us something. It took a while to figure out. From offline switchers to bridgeless PFC, there are three typical balance points between efficiency, difficulty to control, and ability to correct power factor. However, the one that we're talking about today is a little different. It takes notes from a resonant full H converter and also the bridgeless PFC combines the two and it becomes a resonant isolated boost converter. This thing is nuts, and it establishes voltage boost isolation and high efficiency. Whoa, what's the catch? Well, the stability criterion of this converter may be more complex than a typical boost PFC. Not only do we need to ensure the normal stability within the control loop, we also need to ensure that we can establish resonance with all component tolerances considered. And while I want to love this topology, and I want to believe it's a practical solution to our problem, it really scares me. And I'd rather design this converter as a project in itself rather than as a part of a larger system because the component tolerance of the leakage inductance on our hand-wound transformers may make it difficult to guarantee resonance. My general strategy 
is to select topologies that are less dependent on a specific value of leakage inductance. That'll help us to mitigate the risk associated with wide tolerance on leakage inductance, which is a big reason why we shifted from a push-pull DC to DC converter to a full H. Even if we don't end up using it today, I think it's really interesting, so I've linked to that source article, the article that describes the resonant bridgeless PFC in the description of this video. It's well written, describes the operating mode of the converter in detail, and it was a fun read. However, I've sunk enough time into designing circuits that don't work as well as we need them to, and I'd rather design a simple topology well than des design a complex or interesting topology poorly. This resonant bridgeless PFC was a research project for a reason, and it's likely not easy to implement well. As far as I can tell, no physical hardware was created to implement the topology and it stayed in simulation land. The article suggests that a standard bridgeless PFC controller can be used, but something is just raising a red flag in my head, like, I'm thinking that it just can't be as simple as they're saying it is. I don't totally rule out resonant topologies, like, they have their place and I think they're great, but I think that more analysis is required to know if this will fit well into our system. Perhaps it's just a familiarity thing and... I should really explore this concept further. I suspect that the same limitations that pushed us to a two-phase design may push us towards a two-stage PFC. My plan right now is to move forward with a two-phase PFC leading to a full HDC to DC converter to finish the conversion. As a thought experiment though, I thought it would be interesting to see what kind of trouble we could get in just by driving our power supply directly from rectified AC and feeding that to our push-pull converter. I mean, it's worth thinking about, right? I pulled together some calculations and a quick simulation to explore this idea. In order to achieve 2400 watts of output power with no more than 40 volts of input ripple, voltage, will require 3.75 millifarads of capacitors. Those need to withstand at least 250 volts DC, and that is not as bad as I was expecting. I'm sure there's an A number of giant electrolytic caps that might fit inside this box that could provide that much capacitance at this voltage. With that in mind, we'll set up the simulation. A bridge rectifier, 3.75 millifarads of capacitance and a 2400 watt load. The simulation confirms our calculations regarding voltage ripple, but how does the power factor in ripple current look? By showing both voltage and current through the AC source. Whew, wow, that is awful. A power factor of one would be a sinusoidal current in phase with mains and an RMS amplitude of 24 amps. What we're seeing from the power supply fed with rectified DC is that we're drawing current from mains 30% of the time and the wave shape looks more like a series of right triangles than a sinusoid. It's difficult to say just looking at the waveform, but we might be looking at a power factor near or even less than 0.1. This is fundamentally nothing like a resistive load. Diving in deeper, we'll find that the peak current in our bulk capacitors is 140 amps and the RMS ripple current is 52 amps. I think that'll be very difficult to find capacitors with this kind of a voltage rating, ripple current rating, and capacitance. We're talking like 20 caps in parallel territory. Like this is not good. This is not going to work at all. What we're seeing is so bad that I think that fixed frequency PWM into a boost stage could actually help the situation a lot. Our current won't be exactly sinusoidal, but hey, at least we can spread the current out over more of the main cycle and reduce the ripple current on our capacitors, right? To explore this concept, I added a fixed frequency 30% duty cycle boost stage with an output rectifier diode. Wow, would you look at that difference? Even just adding a fixed frequency PWM boost stage resulted in a massive improvement of power factor. We're drawing a mostly sinusoidal current over the entire main cycle. It appears there's a bit of a discontinuity as we get closer to the zero crossings at the main cycle, but hey, I'll take this over simple rectification any day of the week. From a power factor perspective, this actually looks somewhat acceptable. Not to mention the ripple current has been reduced from 52 amps to 31. That's a 40% reduction. Even better, our circuit now only requires around 1.8 millifarads of capacitance to keep the output voltage stable. A simple PFC algorithm running on a microcontroller to extend the range of our zero crossings may be able to achieve great power factor if we put it behind the wheel of a couple boost phases. I'm very excited to see what happens here, but power factor correction is certainly less mystifying than it was before. Dang. A simple boost converter goes a long way to improve performance over a bridge rectifier. Overall, I'd say that we aren't quite to an executable solution, but we have some great options. More importantly, we're moving forward with the two-phase boost PFC unless another roadblock gets in the way. 
No matter what power supply we select, I know that a transformer will be required to establish isolation, and this transformer needs to handle 2400 watts. So before I get bogged down in all the architecture development, let's take this one step further. Let's design a transformer capable to handle this power with the full H topology and the input voltage from the PFC. I think that the larger question to ask today is, can we implement the input filter, some method of PFC, and an H-bridge power converter for the same cost as an off-the-shelf power supply with the same power output? It's around 100 bucks for a power supply like this. I'll take some time to refine this and think about it behind the scenes, and we'll talk again soon. If you like what you saw today, then consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos, where we'll design the custom transformer capable of moving 2400 watts and define the architecture of the larger UPS. Should be a lot of fun. I think that mains connected high voltage power supplies are awesome, and if you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, following us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!